Laten we met de leiding beginnen, hebben we traditioneel altijd uh, even een kort overzicht van uh, wat we het afgelopen jaar als stichting hebben gedaan. En uh, ik ga de slidepresentatie uh, even sharen en dan gaan we daar doorheen lopen. Nogmaals welkom. Oké, okay, ik hoop dat mijn slides voor iedereen uh, zichtbaar zijn inmiddels. Op de agenda van de avond, het welkomstwoord heb ik net uitgesproken. We doen een korte overzichtje van uh, onze activiteiten van het afgelopen jaar. We hebben enkele huishoudelijke mededelingen. En daarna is het tijd voor uh, het hoofdgerecht van de avond, de Hermans no lezing 2024. Die door Jouw Sedan wordt verzorgd. Daarna behandelen we jullie vragen en daarna sluiten we af. Oké, okay. wat hebben we gedaan het afgelopen jaar? We hebben als bestuur hard gewerkt aan onze social media pressen. We hebben een Facebook page opgezet. En die is te vinden onder de naam Herman Nelson Snow Stichting op Facebook. Daar sharen we uh, filmpjes van uh, studenten, van mensen, allemaal die bezig zijn met het beoefenen van de exacte wetenschappen. Nou, als we Facebook doen, moeten we tegenwoordig natuurlijk ook Instagram doen. Dus we hebben ook op Instagram een uh, pagina van de Herman Snow Stichting. En ons YouTube-kanaal, dat was er uh, al voordat dit uh, verslagjaar begon. Dus ook daar is informatie en content van onze stichting te vinden. Bij deze willen we jullie allemaal vragen om onze pages te liken, uh, te abonneren op ons YouTube-kanaal, onze pagina's te volgen. En als we dus content uh, erop uh, plaatsen of jullie dat willen sharen. Binnen je netwerk, zodat onze stichting steeds meer bekendheid krijgt. Oké, okay. dit jaar hebben we ook uh, de tweede keer de, een HNS-talk georganiseerd. En deze keer was Jelissa Veldwijk uh, de spreker. Aan de rechterkant uh, zijn enkele indrukken te zien in het filmpje dat daar rolt. Jelissa is afgestudeerd Bachelor of Science in de medische natuurwetenschappen en doet nu de master in Biomedical Technology and Physics aan de Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Op 30 januari jongsleden hebben we ongeveer 100 leerlingen van het EP Meijer Lyceum. Dat is uh, de school die vroeger Lico 2, of die in de populair Lico 2 genoemd wordt. Die hebben dus de HNS-talk gevolgd. Het waren allemaal examenkandidaten, uh, dus uh, leerlingen van de zesde klas, die een S-pakket hebben. Jelisa heeft verteld over de inhoud van haar studie, over toepassingen in de praktijk, over mogelijkheden die je hebt op de arbeidsmarkt als je die studie gedaan hebt. En ze heeft het ook even gehad over het leven als Surinaamse student in Nederland. En tot slot was er ook een interactieve quiz, uh, waarvan de beelden daar rechts uh, een korte impressie geven. Dus dat was onze tweede HNS-talk. Het was heel leuk, het was een heel leuke ochtend. Leuk om ook te vermelden is dat uh, op ons YouTube-kanaal nu ook de opnames van de eerste HNS-talk, die in november 2022 was verzorgd door Shova Snow. En die was toen op schoolgemeenschap Quata. Die is nu ook te vinden uh, online op ons YouTube-kanaal. Die HNS-talk ging toen over uh, natuurkunde en de toepassingen in de natuurkunde. Nou, door het jaar heen doen we dan altijd ook uh, huldigingen. Dit jaar hebben we drie personen gehuldigd. De eerste was de winnaar van de Surinaamse Wiskunde Olympiade voor junioren in 2023. En zijn naam is Rayaan Subhan. Gisteren uh, hebben we Rayaan in persoon mogen ontvangen. En hebben we onze oorkonde overhandigd en natuurlijk ook een klein presentje. 
De tweede persoon die we dit jaar huldigen is uh, Christopher Tekam. Hij is degene die de hoogste score heeft behaald van de Surinaamse deelnemers aan de internationale natuurkunde Olympiade die in 2023 werd gehouden. Die was toen in Tokio, Japan. Christopher was helaas niet in staat om in persoon zijn uh, oorkonde in ontvangst te nemen en zijn presentje, omdat hij uh, in het district Nikeri woont en uh, naar school gaat. En hij is examenkandidaat en hij is nu druk bezig met zijn tweede schoolonderzoek. Maar dat maakt de felicitaties aan Christopher niet minder daarom. Dus uh, proficiat. En de derde persoon, dat is Sanaya Rampedarit Singh. Helaas is het ook niet gelukt om haar in persoon haar uh, oorkonde en haar presentje uh, te overhandigen omdat ze onverwachts helaas niet meer uh, kan langskomen. Zij is als eerste afgestudeerd van het cohort 2018 van de studierichting Biologie van de faculteit Wis- en Natuurkundige Wetenschappen van de Anton de Kom Universiteit Suriname. Dus dat is ook een prachtige prestatie. Alle drie van harte proficiat en uh, ga zo door. Sanaya, als je in de meeting bent, dan geef ik je nu heel kort even het woord het om woord? iets te zeggen. Om iets te zeggen. Heel hartelijk dank mevrouw. Uh, ja, inderdaad, ik houd heel kort en bondig. Ik voel me super vereerd om vanavond tussen jullie te mogen zitten tijdens de uh, lezing. En ook enorm dankbaar dat ik deze huldiging heb mogen ontvangen van jullie. Uh, mijn, mijn dank gaat natuurlijk uit... Uh, en, mijn dank gaat natuurlijk in het bijzonder uit naar de universiteit, zonder wie dit natuurlijk niet mogelijk was geweest. En ook in het bijzonder het bestuur van de Herman Nelson Snow Stichting. Ik hoop ten zeerste dat dit de jongere generatie um, motiveert en ook de moed kan helpen vinden om een keuze in de exacte wetenschappen te kiezen. Want vaak genoeg lijkt dat een uitdaging te zijn, waardoor men vaak genoeg... Uh, ja, een beetje afschrikt, maar uh, het is mogelijk, alles is mogelijk. Dus ik hoop dat ik ten eerste ook uh, een, een beetje de weg heb kunnen openen voor de volgende generatie die natuurlijk uh, het beter zal doen. Dank u wel. Nou, nou. Beter had ik het niet uh, kunnen uh, samenvatten, want dat is precies uh, de reden waarom we deze hulde gingen doen. Uh, hartelijk dank, Sanaya, voor je prachtige woorden. En het is inderdaad uh, het doel om door deze huldigingen uh, andere jongeren te stimuleren om ook te kiezen voor een looppad uh, binnen de exacte wetenschappen. Fantastisch. Nou, uh, het werk van de Herman van Snow Stichting kunt u ondersteunen. Het mag financieel via een donatie op een van deze bankrekeningnummers. Maar als je zoiets hebt van, uh, ik zou graag ook een keer willen uh, participeren bij de activiteiten van de stichting, dan kunt u altijd contact maken met een van de bestuursleden. Mijn naam is Ilemele Venetiaan, ik ben voorzitter van de stichting. De uh, penningmeester is Saskia Malsels Haltuin. De secretaris is Peris Goethar. En we hebben ook twee bestuursleden, Bernardo Panka en Gladys Snow. Uh, dus als iemand uh, een donatie wil doen, waarvoor we, waarvoor we bijvoorbeeld dank zeggen, het zij financieel, het zij een andere manier, dan weet u ons te vinden. U kunt altijd een uh, bericht sturen via onze social media uh, het, uh, kanalen en dan zullen we daarop reageren. Nou, enkele huishoudelijke mededelingen. Deze Zoom-meeting wordt opgenomen en live uitgezonden via YouTube. We vragen aan iedereen om alstublieft uw microfoon op mute te houden tijdens de lezing. Indien u een vraag wenst te stellen, tik uw vraag in de chatbox van Zoom. Of tik uw vraag in de chatbox van YouTube, indien u via de YouTube livestream deelneemt. Na de presentatie zal de inleider de vragen dan behandelen. Nou, dan zijn we aangekomen bij het uh, hoofdgerecht van vanavond, de Herman Snow Lezing 2024, die door Jouse Dakwoord gehouden over Developments and Applications 
of generative artificial intelligence. Ik ga heel kort wat over Joe vertellen. Ik kan u vertellen, zijn CV is very impressive. Maar uh, ik hou het vanavond op een paar punten. Maar geloof u me, it's impressive. Joe Zedok is universitair docent informatiesystemen bij de afdeling technologie, operations en statistiek aan de Stern School of Business van de New York University. Hij is verbonden aan de NYU Stern Fuben Center for Technology, Innovation en Business. Jou is ook verbonden aan de Center for Data Science, ML2 Lab, aan de NYU. Interesses gaan uit naar Large Language Models, Generatieve AI, Conversational Agents, Deep Learning, Hierarchische Modellen en Tijdreeksanalyse. Voordat hij bij NYU Stern kwam, werkte hij als assistent onderzoeker bij de Department of Computer Science aan de Johns Hopkins University. Zhao had ook een carrière in kwantitatieve financiering, waarbij hij wiskundige modellen toepaste op voorspelling van financiële instrumenten. Hij heeft meer dan 30 tijdschrift- en conferentiepublicaties op zijn naam staan en heeft talloze prijzen ontvangen, waaronder de Microsoft Research Dissertation Award. Hij behaalde zijn PhD in Computer and Information Science aan de University of Pennsylvania. En natuurlijk zijn we er apen trots op dat Joe ook lid is van de wetenschappelijke adviesraad van de Herman Nelson Snow Stichting. Joe is een sranaman. Hij is de zoon van uh, Betty Sedok en Eddie Sedok. Maar hij woont al meer dan 30 jaar in de Verenigde Staten van Amerika. Dus de taal waarin hij op dit moment vloeiend is, is Engels. Dus vanavond zal de lezing in het Engels gehouden worden. Nou, dan ga ik stappen met Sharon en dan zeg ik, uh, without further ado, Jou, the floor is yours. Oké, okay. <clears throat> bedankt Tila Mille voor uh, die introductie. En um, ik zal inderdaad uh, nu... Uh, naar het Engels toe gaan, want ik kan mezelf beter uitspreken in het Engels. So, um, uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's my pleasure to talk about um, generative artificial intelligence. It's a topic that I do my research on and that I'm also very passionate about. Uh, first and foremost, uh, yeah, ik ben van Suriname. I'd like to dedicate this talk to my parents who have uh, both passed but are with us today. Um, and now I'd like to move into our main topic for today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about are large language models, uh, which are in some sense the fundamental components of generative AI. Uh, for uh, language. And so what we see over here is that language models have been improving in their capacity as uh, the amount of parameters or the scale of the model increases. And one of the most known models uh, is what's called uh, ChatGPT or GPT-4. Um, but there are many different models, like Google's Gemini and Claude 3 from Anthropic, which are uh, some of the current most popular models. And so these models are uh, being used in many, many different applications today and have been um, sort of revolutionary for the field um, and are going to make large impacts uh, in society um, and business. Uh, and so I'd like to talk about these uh, and generative AI um, in aggregate. Uh, so what we see is that uh, large language models are um, competitive with humans on a select set of tasks. So we have things like general knowledge and SAT exams, uh, which are uh, entrance exams for uh, 
a high school student in universities in the US, and then various different other types of exams. And what we see is that these models are outperforming average human performance. And in fact, if we uh, look over many different types of um, exams and uh, different assessments metrics, uh, what we find is that um, as we moved from uh, these sort of models uh, that were smaller and smaller in parameters like GPT-2 up to larger models like GPT-3, GPT-3.5, which is ChatGPT and GPT-4, uh, we see improved performance. And we went from being better on average in all of these tasks, um, you know, than average humans to almost being at expert human level performance. And so it begs sort of a question, which is a question that I've been particularly interested in, uh, which is, can we think of intelligence now as a commodity? Right. And so what I mean by this is that uh, before we saw information like via Google search uh, commoditized and with chat GPT and large language models and generative AI, uh, what we're seeing is that uh, certain types of intelligence might be able to be captured and utilized in more of a commodity fashion. Uh, so why are we here? Uh, so I think really one of my goals that I really want to have people get out um, is to understand modern AI, a little bit about how it will change our lives. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about uh, large language models, chat GPT, generative AI um, as a whole, and what they can do today. In particular, we'll go into sort of a little bit of um, what, uh, what, what the underlying uh, training process is and what large language models are, and then we'll move on to uh, more about application, where, uh, where they're used, what the opportunities are, what the risks are. Then I'll move into uh, Q&A and hopefully we can talk there in the Q&A about uh, some of the places where generative AI can go into the future. Uh, and what I want as key takeaways are um, basically, I think that large language models, generative AI and these foundational models uh, create a basis for democratizing artificial intelligence um, capabilities. And what I mean by democratizing is basically the fact that, you know, access is global. And by access being global, it means that the information is no longer as constrained. And we already saw this in search, but now I think we're going to see this in an even larger extent. Uh, with generative AI. And then I'm also going to try to show where the current capabilities of generative AI. Okay, so now let's dig in a bit. So the first thing that I want us to talk about are what are language models? Even before we take and we talk about the large, let's just talk about what language models are. So language models are have been part of your life for a long time now. And what I mean by that is that in your phone, uh, you can see that you know we have these predictive texts. So here we have somebody remind me to tell you about our trip uh, to the mountains. And then you're typing, I forgot all about that, can't. And then your phone gives you some suggestions like wait, believe, remember, right? What is a language model? It is a model that tries to predict the next word that you're about to say, right? That's 
in some sense, the fundamental basis of what a language model is. And the reason why language models are generative is because you can generate one word, but then after you generate that word, you can generate the next word, right? And so on. And there are other examples of generative AI that you're already familiar with, like Google Translate um, or Siri, which have now become very much part of our normal lives. So what about large language models? Well, large language models are deep neural networks that are trained on large amounts of data in order to predict the next word. And what that means is that we give the language model some context, and the context could be some set of words, it could be words and images and audio or any number of stuff, right? And what we try to do is use it to predict. And in doing so, we learn more and more ways of being able to understand the world. And this is sort of what I was showing in the previous slide, that the capabilities as the neural networks got deeper and bigger, these capabilities allowed us uh, to be able to uh, do almost unexpected tasks, like explain jokes and translate uh, whole documents, to be able to uh, go and uh, create uh, new images that have never been created before, right? And so what is sort of happening and how this came about is the fact that we started with uh, this new architecture, which was called the Transformers architecture, which came about uh, by some researchers from Google in 2017. Um, and this architecture allowed us to scale the neural networks to be larger and larger. And the other thing that came about thanks to the internet is a large amount of training data. And according to OpenAI, um, GPT-4 was trained on about uh, 100 terabytes of text, which is a petabyte of text. Um, and they used a machine learning algorithm in order to be able to train uh, this model. And the machine learning algorithm takes some weights and, it, and uh, some loss function and is able to update the parameters. And we'll go about how it does that in a second. Uh, but based off of this machine learning model, we trained, or OpenAI trained GPT-4, uh, which is a large language model, which has about 1.8 trillion parameters. So going into what a large language model does is basically it has an input which is recite the first laws of robotics in this case, and then some output. And the output, for instance, could be a robot may not injure humans. Um, and so the language model will predict each word one at a time um, until it gets a, um, a, a statement that it's the end of the prediction. So large language models like uh, GPT-3 start and they are pre-trained with large amounts of data to predict the next word, like I keep on saying, and then we have this final model. So let's look at how this is really going to happen and be done. So the way that this happens is that we start off with um, the input, which is a robot must, and then we have the correct output, which is obey. But when we're doing the training, the let's say the large language model predicts exterminate. Then what we'd see is that no, this should have actually been obey. We calculate the error for predicting the wrong word. And then we update that um, to the parameters of the large language model. 
right? And this update is going to continue happening for a long amount of time. Um, and these models are trained off of thousands of GPUs for months of time. Um, in fact, it's, it's an enormous amount of time and also quite expensive. According to the estimates, it took about uh, $100 million to train GPT-4. So continuing to dive in uh, to how these models work, uh, the way that we can conceptualize uh, GPT or GPT style models is that they start with this pre-training. And once you train the model, you have this sort of neural network. And when we talk about um, the neural network, what we're really talking about here are these connections and these connections are parameters. And so you can imagine like there's, you know, a trillion different parameters or a trillion different connections that we see from the input uh, that are connected to the output. And so this is what is going to define our pre-trained, oops, uh, language model. And then after that, we start to try to tailor this model to what we really want, right? And the model itself is initially trained just to you to, just to predict the next word. But in general, that's actually not enough. And so what you need to do is to then train it to understand what humans want. And when we do that, we will update some parameters of the model, like here in red. So as we get this new training data and the feedback from what humans want, we will update uh, each of the components. We will possibly add parameters, we'll possibly add layers. And then the final component in uh, ChatGPT is where it also goes and we add guardrails. These guardrails make sure that let's say it doesn't have toxic or hate speech. And then finally, uh, dialogue management component. What this will do is it will look at the history of the conversation that you've been having with uh, ChatGPT and be able to manage that conversation in a way uh, that is sort of fluent and throughout and understands your objectives. Then there are additional capabilities about the future additional capabilities that are being added to ChatGPT. Um, so for instance, there are things like web search where it can look anything up in the internet. Um, there are APIs to calculators and more complicated logical engines, um, integrations with databases and knowledge graphs and many more additional components and in some sense, you know, the information really has no place to hide. If we can access the information, we can figure out how to take that information and put it into the language model, right? And so that's sort of the basic idea or the fundamentals of how these large language models really work. So, the next question is, well, what can these language models do, right? And so this is, I think, more, aside from how they work, what they can do is actually much more interesting. So to start off with, what I decided to do is to, you know, sort of do a fun little experiment and ask ChatGPT what large language models can do. And so ChatGPT said, well, large language models can do content creation. Uh, they can help with uh, programming, um, help you debug. They can help with data analysis, uh, education and learning, uh, things like customer support, creativity and building, you know, generating images and music, uh, translation, 
helping research and gather information, uh, entertainment and gaming. And it even claims uh, that it can talk about ethics and morality. Uh, that I think is a far, a little far out there in terms of the claim, uh, but certainly you can talk about it. Whether it's actually giving you good arguments about morality is is something that's beyond the scope of our talk, but something that's fun to play around with. So let's start by looking at sort of the first one, which is thinking about writing and the writing assistant. So I would call this a productivity tool. What I mean by a productivity tool is a way in which you can actually do a task faster than you could have before. So an example of this would be, let's take a particular bullet point that you have and turn that into an email, right? Um, this is obviously a little bit of a joke, but um, a real and very important and critical use case is actually being able to take an email. Let's say, for instance, you have an email that you're drafting and it's in English and you're unsure about how to express it properly in English. Well, one uh, way of doing that could be to actually, oops, um, one way of doing that could actually be to um, uh, create, ask ChatGPT to help you change the language um, in this to make it more fluent and English sounding, right? And ChatGPT can do this for you very well. Um, and a funny thing about this cartoon that I really like is, um, uh, you can also take a very long email and make a single bullet point out of this. Uh, funny enough, like this actually already exists uh, within Google's Gmail system. Uh, Gemini is there and Gemini uh, can actually take an email and make it more formal. It can also take a long email and help summarize that email because sometimes I get emails that are really long and I want to see the key points of that email. And, uh, you know, large language models and generative AI are there and they can already do this. Another example of a productivity tool, uh, which we talked about is really about coding. Uh, so Microsoft's GitHub Copilot is one of those tools. I use this in uh, my own work. So here's an example where you start out with a function definition and Copilot will go and it will create the code for you. Then you can ask it other things like write a unit test. For those of you who you pro those of you in the audience who program, you know that these are annoying to write. And the generative AI can do this and it can do it automatically for you. Um, and this is actually one of the most amazing use cases and very productive use cases of ChatGPT. Um, it is uh, surprising how, um, how much code is now being written by these automated generative tools. Um, recent statements are almost as much as 30% of code is already automatically written, uh, which I think is, is fantastic and amazing. And again, what it's doing is it's increasing human productivity. So another example that GPT gave was um, data analysis. So here's some work that... Um, I did earlier, uh, which is where we actually integrated um, a large language model as part of a data science tool. Okay, let's create a logistic regression to predict the target variable. It's called target. Okay, let's look to see how good 
uh, this logistic regression is. Okay, so let's let's see. Instead of uh, plotting accuracy, let's plot the ROC curve since the data is in balance. So what we're showing here is basically a um, tool which not only can do data analysis for you, uh, but even has integration with um, uh, voice and integration and automatic program execution, right? So what we see here is, is a prototype of a tool that's actually able to work with you um, in an interface that's completely voice in order to actually analyze and look at different um, uh, write code for you to do automatic data analysis. So another bit of work that I'm actually really excited by is looking at uh, generative AI as a way of teaching. So the idea behind uh, this is that teaching and teaching students how to teach is not a trivial task. And doing individualized teaching of students is really infeasible at scale. So one of the things that generative AI, one of the capabilities that generative AI has uh, in terms of democratization of knowledge is really to be able to actually go and um, teach people. In this case, what we're seeing is a student who's learning how to debug. And the student is actually talking to um, a generative AI agent which is helping the student, where the student is actually helping the AI assistant to solve a problem. And we have the student help to debug. One of the ways that we know from education really works is to actually, instead of having uh, someone listen to a conversation or be taught, to actually also have the person interactively try to teach. And this is one of the greatest new applications. And I think what we're going to see is that this is going to be one of the ways in which we teach our students more and more. And we can see that these applications aren't uh, just for, let's say, you know, teaching people how to debug code. Uh, they're also for, you know, applications like an application called, an app called Duolingo, uh, where within Duolingo, it's got the ability to help you understand and learn about how to speak, let's say French in this case. Uh, and what the what's really interesting about how this technology can be transformative uh, for teaching is the fact that this means that we can meet our students where they are. It also means that students, let's say, if they um, don't have access uh, to teachers, they might be able to have access to AI systems. So for instance, Khan Academy is an online um, school, which is trying to integrate automated uh, learning as part of their um, process, right? However, there's another problem with we, which we have with large language models, which in generative AI, which can be, well, not only can they be a teaching assistant, but they can also be a cheating assistant, uh, 
which is something that I and my colleagues have talked a lot about, um, which is how to deal with the fact that education and classical ways of being able to, oops, uh, classical ways of being able to um, go and uh, examine students have issues, right? So for instance, a multiple choice exam that's online, a student may go and ask uh, ChatGPT um, the question, the exam question, whether it's true or false, and ChatGPT will often give an answer. Well, it will always give an answer and it'll often give a correct answer. What we saw before, right, was the fact that ChatGPT is above average human at a whole bunch of things like trivia and quizzes and stuff that we're trying to teach students. And so this is actually a very interesting and new challenge for teaching where teaching has become disrupted in the way in which we are trying to teach, at least at the university level, to our students. Because assessment has fundamentally become more difficult. And so ultimately, this presents a set of risks, but also opportunities. So one of the things that I think is great is the fact that we should be able to leverage um, these you know, benefits uh, from generative AI. However, there are some risks like that generative AI will do all the thinking for the students, right? A student can go, they can plug in their homework to generative AI, and it can just solve the problem for them. And the student doesn't think about what they're trying to learn. Another example could be, well, a student, instead of taking and working through a problem, a student may be able to quickly find the answer without trying to understand reasons uh, behind this. And finally, and I think this is one of the most dangerous uh, things about generative AI is that now the generative AI has become so much better. Uh, it is also very easy for students to think that it is often or always correct. However, generative AI can often actually be, um, you know, incorrect and unfaithful in terms of the answers that it would give. Now, on the other hand, there are real opportunities, right? So like we talked about with respect to teaching assistants, students can really leverage the new and leverage and learn about these new emerging technologies. And by using the technologies, they can understand the limitations. Beyond just understanding limitations, a potential opportunity for students is the ability to potentially focus more on analysis and critical thinking. And I think that analysis and critical thinking are very important in terms of future skills and how to use these tools, because the ability to properly work through a problem and really think about how the problem should be specified, what the steps are, how to do the intermediate component becomes more and more valuable versus uh, the details, which now you can have this generative AI as an ability to do this. Finally, potentially students could practice careful editing and think about how to critique what the generative AI is doing and build a relationship with the tool where the tool doesn't just um, answer the question, uh, but instead there's a back and forth. It's almost like a dialogue or a conversation uh, that students can have with these tools. So generative AI can do more than just text. 
Uh, so far, I've talked about large language models, uh, but we can also generate images, we can generate speech, we can now even generate videos, which I think is the most amazing thing. And so very recently, um, uh, OpenAI came out with a tool that they're calling Sora, uh, which is a tool that can automatically generate videos. And so here's a quick example. Uh, so they wrote a prompt, which is a close-up view of a glass sphere uh, that has a Zen garden within it. There's a small dwarf in the sphere who is raking the Zen garden to create patterns in the sand. And here's the video which is created. So personally, to me, this was amazing. Uh, and these are tools that we will, so Sora isn't available to the general public yet, but it will be actually within the next couple months. Uh, these tools are amazing tools, which will really take us further in terms of our creativity and the ability to generate um, new and interesting thoughts, right? Okay, so having spoken a, a little bit about how, what large language models and generative AI can do, let's talk a little bit about how you can use large language models and generative AI. So the first and most common way of using generative AI are web interfaces. Here, what I mean are websites, and so before I showed you several links to OpenAI's ChatGPT, Microsoft's Bing Chat Copilot, uh, Gemini, uh, which is Google's model, uh, Claude, which is coming from Anthropic. And all of these have web pages where you can interactively type text, you can upload documents, uh, you can put in images, and it will automatically output uh, text for you and you can interact. Uh, many of these tools have free versions. Um, actually, all of the ones that I listed below have uh, before have free versions and you can interact with them right now, right? Well, preferably not during the talk, but you know. Um, even uh, Zoom, I don't think our version of Zoom uh, has this, uh, but we in our, you know, in uh, certain versions of Zoom, you have the ability to have automatic Zoom summaries. Uh, you have automatic questions uh, that you can ask to the chat in order to catch up for the chat. Uh, similarly, in Microsoft Teams, uh, so we see all of these um, uh, different interfaces really sort of integrating. Uh, then there are mobile apps. Uh, so for instance, WhatsApp has a mobile app called Meta AI. Um, we have another app, uh, for instance, ChatGPT has an app, Copilot has an app, and all of these are mobile applications. Uh, which you can easily use and are integrated in your phones, right? So that's sort of the second way uh, to use these. A third way that we all will start using generative AI is actually also through integrated software components. So what I mean by integrated software components are, for instance, Microsoft Office, has a um, application called Copilot. Um, Google within their office suite has Gemini. Um, another example is Adobe Photoshop has an application that's called Firefly. Each of them have integrated components of large language models in the software. So here's an example of Adobe's Firefly. So 
So what we can see is basically the fact that each of these are integrated. We can just automatically um, put and interact with language to this application. And it automatically has this integration um, between the software and um, uh, what's going on, right? And so you can just type and automatically change images. And this is part another way of interacting with these generative AI tools where what they can do is really work with you, right, in terms of software. So then we have more programmatic access. And what I mean by programmatic access is now we go to interfaces where instead of just using pre-built applications, you can build your own custom applications for yourself, for your business, for um, you know, other sort of companies. And on the left is basically how we're all interacting with these through apps or um, through uh, websites. And then on the right is basically how you, right, can create um, your own interface. And so here's an example of Microsoft's uh, low code large language model interface. And so this is a tool which is going to be created um, for actually being able to uh, write a different types of essay. So let's see. Um, ah, there. Sorry. I think there's a thanks. So write an essay about uh, advertising information uh, and manipulation. And so the larger, larger planning API starts with a flow chart, which the other language model like ChatGPT will then follow. And you can organize the flow, you can change it around, you can change the different prompts that are part of this workflow yourself, right? And once you finish that, then you can interact with the model that you've now created. And you can immediately be able to generate your own type of AI system, right? And these types of low code interfaces are going to be one of the main ways that um, people are going to interact with the large language models. Uh, and then there's the final way of interacting or one of the ways of interacting with the large language models, which is through web APIs, so web application programming interfaces. And a programming interface is basically a way to call ChatGPT's interface through your own code. And so what's happening over here is we see we have our own data and we have, let's say, GPT 3.5 that's been trained on a large amount of data. And we write our own personal assistant in our code, let's say Python code or what have you. And then a user can go and interact with our AI system. And so this is a uh, one or the main way in which uh, startups are using uh, large language models. The final way that one could use large language models is through in-house um, hosting of your own language model. Um, but that's a little bit harder to, to draw. So what I'm showing over here is the ability to call 
Um, and what will happen is basically you write some code and your code calls out to the language model and the language model can go and it can look at your own documents using a uh, uh, using a method called retrieval augmented generation. And so it can find and retrieve from your custom document base uh, the relevant documents to what the user is typing or querying, and then give out um, the user uh, some reply to the user, which is contextualized to your personal um, uh, to your personal setting, right? Whether it be a customer service chatbot, a chatbot that's trying to help people with um, different types of mental health problems, a chatbot that's working on um, substance use, which is something that I'm currently working on at the moment. Um, you know, something that tries to answer questions about math problems or coding, right? Uh, when we looked at that, um, the debugging assistant, the debugging assistant was trained uh, in exactly this manner, right? This is the main way in which people create new applications uh, using uh, web application programming interfaces. So now that we've talked about all of the use cases and hopefully I've given you some context about uh, generative AI and where we're going, we can talk about what the risks are for generative AI. And one of the things that you will see that I don't have as a risk is uh, that generative AI will take over and will have a scenario like the Terminator. Instead, I think that there's much more concrete risks. So the first sort of risk is that it's known that these large language models and generative AI in general exhibits bias that exists in the data that it was trained on. And even though the um, companies try to do this human feedback training at the very end, you don't often have this ability uh, to fully control what's happening. And so these biases exist. Uh, and a very famous example of a bias is when you ask a vanilla generative AI to uh, create images of executives, it will in general uh, generate white males in suits. Um, and this is the kind of bias that Google was trying to correct for, and it just recently came out, um, uh, was had a, a thing in the news where it overcorrected and made you know headlines for having overly corrected you know where Abraham Lincoln was black and Nazis were diverse right so there's you know the bias and the bias correction is a very tricky thing uh, another real risk and issue is fair use of content so a lot of these models are trained on uh, petabytes of data. This is an incredibly large amount of data that are being used. And often uh, content creators, right? People who create, let's say, Instagram posts or Reddit, um, they don't necessarily want their content to be used and monetized in large language models. Another example is basically some artists are now suing OpenAI and Google uh, because it can mimic content of uh, creators, right? And so these are, are issues that are about legality. Another problem, and we spoke about this, uh, we talked about it shortly, is basically being truthful. Often, large language models are accidentally untruthful. Uh, sometimes this is called hallucination. Uh, but what happens is, is that the large language models are built to predict the next word. Well, sometimes they just make up a scenario that seems reasonable, right? 
For instance, we could ask the question, where is Zhuang Sadak from? When you ask ChatGPT that question, if you don't let it look up on the internet, uh, it will say that I'm from Portugal um, because that's the most likely place that I'd be from, right? Given the name, which is obviously not true. Um, beyond that, we can actually purposefully create um, untruthful information. So on the right-hand side, you can see my fake news image, uh, you know, the creation of misinformation and disinformation is something that is actually a really big problem with large language models. And most of the large language model companies are trying to uh, put guardrails in place to stop mis and disinformation, uh, to stop their tools for being used for mis and disinformation. And finally, uh, the large language models or generative AI in, in has low transparency. What this means is that if you ask me, um, why did the language model say this to me? It is very difficult, nay almost impossible, to actually tell you what the reason is why uh, the the to tell you about the behavior of the language model. And so this low transparency is another real issue and risk. And so if you don't know exactly how the content is being created, this could mean that something is made up that's untruthful, and yet um, it can create a huge amount of risk, right? Where somebody, let's say a student or somebody who's asking questions about medical advice might trust the language model because they have no way of checking and doing explanation, which is a open area in the field that a lot of people are trying to work on. So finally, let me talk a little bit about where you can learn more. Um, there are lots of online resources about generative AI. It's an extremely popular area at the moment. Um, and so there's great videos on YouTube. Um, Udacity has a whole class on generative AI. Unfortunately, it's not free. Um, but there are free courses like deeplearning.ai has a free course on Coursera that starts um, in a couple of weeks or a week and a half now. Um, Google and IBM have free courses that are actually really nice. Um, I like them a lot. I've uh, looked at their content carefully. And then finally, for students who really want to take a deeper dive into generative AI, um, Neuromatch um, is a um, has a whole class on deep learning, uh, which includes generative AI. It's meant for students. Uh, there'll be in the summer an interactive session that people can participate on. Um, and it's actually, you know, I think um, there are a couple people who participated two years ago, um, and it'll happen this summer again. All right. Thank you for listening. And um, let's open it up to questions now. Thank you, Elsho. Thank you, Joao. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Do you see them? Yes, yes, I see them now. OK, so then maybe you can walk through them and yeah. uh, we can discuss. OK, so um... Does AI determine whether a written thesis is authentic or whether it's been written by AI during research? A student um, can solve this. So what's, what's very interesting about um, the large language models and generative AI is the fact that detecting uh, whether some text is AI written is actually quite difficult. Uh, so the reason why it's so difficult is because students can partially write, 
or I can do an assignment and then I can ask ChatGPT to fix my grammar for me afterwards. Uh, and so detecting whether something is written by AI is very, very difficult. Um, there are some tools that AI companies are now doing, which is called watermarking. Um, in watermarking, what they do is they will uh, slightly change how likely one word is versus another at a generation level. And by doing that, you can actually detect um, because of the slight changes in the likelihood of one or another word, uh, whether this text has been AI generated. Um, but it's, it's actually very difficult um, because the uh, guarantee, making a guarantee is very, very hard. Okay, so um, how do you see assessment of literature reviews um, uh, changing? You know, my experience being that it is necessary to include an oral defense and give that much more weight. Okay, so this is, so I'm on a NYU university wide advisory board and um, I can share also uh, one of the slides that I was showing was actually about from one of our slide decks. Uh, we have actually worked um, and thought about this a lot in the fact that there aren't any easy solutions to this problem. Generative AI has fundamentally disrupted education. Uh, and so what that means is that actually, you know, figuring out how to assess whether your students have learned the material has gotten much, much harder. Uh, so one of the things that we've been advising our colleagues to do is, you know, maybe go back to uh, closed book exams, um, to have oral presentations, uh, to have intermediate uh, components, uh, to actually, include AI teaching assistants as part of their teaching record, part of teaching of their own teaching. Um, but yeah, it's it's actually created, it's really disrupted how we assess because we were using tests as proxies and those proxies are now fundamentally broken um, in a way that has gotten more and more difficult. Um, okay, so AI will be either the best thing that ever happened to us or the worst thing. And if we're not careful, it may be very well the last thing. So there's, um, I feel like there are a subset of people who are very, very much worried about artificial general intelligence as the um, they're worried about the Terminator, Skynet, um, the computers take over type of problem. Uh, personally, having used these models for a very, very long time, um, so I've been working in this area for, for about 10 years now, um, it is unlikely that we will see true super intelligence, uh, meaning that AIs that are more intelligent than people. Um, and I, I don't think that we need to worry about that worst case scenario. I think that what we'll see is that this new type of AI um, will actually increase human productivity incredibly. So there's something like a billion knowledge workers out of the roughly seven or seven billion people. Uh, the estimates are that it will make them anywhere between 40 and 400% more efficient. Uh, those types of efficiencies we haven't seen 
uh, since basically the the advent of the industrial age. And so what I think will will the the aspects of best thing ever, I think that you know that's definitely a possibility. That having been said, I think that the other components like deep fakes, uh, misinformation, disinformation, um, different types of persuasion are real risks with generative AI um, that we really need to consider and figure out how to control and regulate. All right, so, um, okay, so what's the view of needing to learn the skill of writing a scientific paper from scratch? Uh, there are those who say this skill will be dispensable in the future. Yeah, so I also strongly disagree. Um, I think that figuring out how to do academic scholarship or scholarship in general um, is something that will remain. I think that what we will see is that, in fact, creativity and creation is something that we'll do as part of AI human collaboration. And thinking clearly and being able to define the problem clearly and crisply and being able to understand how to use the tools and how to extrapolate is something that um, we'll see, uh, we will actually see as an even import, more important skill. So one of the things that with my students I'm really trying to push now is I'm using the generative AI tool in order to help them uh, be able to execute quicker. But I'm also trying at the same time to have them understand what the flaws of the tool are and think very clearly about how to tell the tool, how to lay out the problem, how to design the problem correctly in order that you know the AI human collaboration works best. Yeah, there's been some you know real um, issues of scientific papers that have become AI generated. Um, one of the journals that um, I'm a reviewer for has banned the use of generative AI as part of the um, part of the writing process. Um, there's going to be some way of, there's going to be some equilibrium state that we're going to get to. Uh, but right now it's so new and disruptive that I think it's become a real problem. Uh, the other thing that I'll note that I've been very, very annoyed by is the fact that sometimes the reviewers uh, will use generative AI instead of doing reviews properly, uh, which is an even worse use of generative AI. Uh, so there's there's all these problems where you can use AI as a shortcut. Um, so while we train the models, there's feedback with which, which errors get calculated. In order to calculate the error, you need a notion of distance. How much uh, the given answer deviates from the correct one. How do you go about choosing the, how do you go about choosing slash creating metrics uh, for words? Okay, so this is a great question. Um, so when we um, go, um, gonna go back to these slides. So what we do is when we have uh, the training step here, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the output. And we actually, as training data, we have the real um, word that was generated. And that word, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the probability that the language model gave to that word. And based off of the probability that the language model gave to that particular word, uh, if we're going to say, well, 
um, we wanted that word to have 100% probability, and it did not. So update your parameters so that the probability of that word having been generated is higher. And so that's um, how we do the training during the unsupervised pre-training process. We say, OK, what is the probability of the correct word? And then we correct uh, the parameters to make it so that the word that's the correct word would have been more likely. And so this is called cross entropy loss. Um, the other training mechanism that we use is called reinforcement learning with human feedback. Here, what we do is we actually have people rank which of the outputs they liked more. And based off of the outputs they like more, we train a model to simulate people. And then we change and update the parameters of this model, so these red uh, dots, in order to be able to um, be closer to what humans would have preferred. And here we use a different type of training function where we try to say which of the outputs uh, is the one that most closely matches what humans, uh, what people would have preferred. Okay. Um, what should we teach our children about uh, the use and misuse of AI? So, I think that um, this is one of the most interesting questions that we have today. Um, one of the things that we need to teach our children about is um, really how to deal with this new tool. Um, and I think the generative AI, in some sense, when we got the internet, we had this new tool that we could use. and the way I like to tell um, people about how they should use these tools or how they should teach their children about to think about these tools is that um, in some sense, this is like having your smartest friend around and at the same time, your dumbest friend around because the language model can be so right it knows so many it knows so much information about the world and yet at the same time it's not able to um you know assess itself when it doesn't know it's not able to uh be able to truly explain why it's doing what it's doing right and so, and so, and that's what makes it both good and bad. And when we think about how to use these tools, um, that's one of the most important ways about how to conceptualize them. The other component that I think is really important is for us to teach children when it's appropriate and inappropriate to use the tool. And this is taking time. Because ChatGPT allows, and, and generative AI as a technology, allows us shortcuts. And these type of shortcuts are very, very attractive, but they can impede the learning process. And so what I would advise in general is basically that um, people in classrooms should actually say and say, OK, this is why you're learning this. And you shouldn't be using this tool because it circumvents these type of learning objectives. So having uh, the generative AI write your class paper for you, for instance, is a clear misuse. Having it you know, help you to rewrite right, is a good use, right? Having, have, helping it having it help you debug your code, right? These are all really good uses of generative AI in large language models.
All right. Um, examples of generative AI in medicine. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't talk about that as much as I wanted to because of time constraints. Um, but right now we have generative AI popping into medicine in tons of different places. Uh, so for instance, uh, one of the use cases is um, actually having doctor's transcripts automatically being changed into notes where when a doctor talks to a patient, they end up needing to write a whole bunch of paperwork. And generative AI tools are almost at a stage where they can automatically do this. Um, another example of the use in medicine is to be able to uh, do follow-up care. So for instance, if you've had a surgery, oftentimes it's really difficult to get the information from you. Um, you know, let's say after you've done a type of knee surgery, you may actually have certain symptoms that need to be monitored. And rather than asking you to come in to um, the clinic, uh, we can use generative AI now to be able to answer, you know, ask you questions about how you're doing, answer questions about medications, and alert um, your primary care helpers for when there's something that is needed, right? And this requires very careful engineering um, in order to make sure that like, we have the right um, balance between what the AI can and cannot do and what's safe for the AI to do and when to go back and make sure that we talk to you know medical professionals. Uh, a final example uh, with people that I'm working with are public health uh, questions. So for instance, uh, there's a lot of people who may have questions about uh, drug use um, or questions about maternal health. Uh, here, large language models present an amazing opportunity for uh, dissemination of information where custom apps are being built to be able to help people all over the world um, talk to uh, chatbots to get answers to questions that they might not have um, themselves um, and be able to also help medical professionals gather the information and understand what people are concerned about in certain communities. Okay, um, so, uh, which software, AI software, can you use for making flyers for business? Um, how can you generate money with AI for X? Um, you, for example, YouTube channels. Yeah, so um, uh, ChatGPT, um, uh, st Stability AI, Stable Diffusion, um, Gemini, they all are pretty good at creating um, mid journey, uh, they're all really good softwares at creating, um, uh, different types of flyers. Uh, it's, there are really nice tutorials online about how to use them in these ways. Um, and I think it's actually really, um, important uh, for people to be able to like use these tools and they're great, great tools um, that we can use. All right, so how can the Surinamese government use AI in health sector uh, with results within months? What are the risks and challenges? Okay, this is a great question. Um, so it depends. Um, in general, when you have sets of documents that are readily available and you have people who are already helping um, with these documents, it makes it a lot easier. So let's say a customer service scenario where people are answering questions about um, uh, healthcare, you know, insurance plans, possible problems. Um, they have questions about um, where to seek help, uh, where things are available. Uh, so I think that uh, these implementations can be done actually really quickly 
when the data is already there in ways that are machine consumable. I think the, the difficulty is when uh, the data is in uh, different places, different formats. Uh, some of the data is really only known by the people and it's not even documented anywhere easily, right? Then it's very, very hard for um, uh, AI to be used. But I think that there are a lot of use cases, like when you have a large corpus of information and the information is in um, uh, tech written in technical manners, uh, the large language models are really good at being able to extract that information and then, uh, you know, give that information. The, one of the problems that I see is that sometimes it can be untruthful. Uh, there are a lot of mitigation methods for this, uh, like showing where the, when it says something, where it came from, what's the supporting documents. Um, but it takes a reasonable amount of engineering. Uh, to be able to set this up. Um, but it's a really um, a really important um, component uh, to be able to integrate these. I think that you know these are these models and the implementation of these models, for instance, if we go over here, um, the implementation of these models through these um, programmatic web applications is much more accessible than it used to be um, with just a couple undergraduates over here at NYU. We were able to create you know, systems for answering questions about drug use uh, but it requires a lot of like creating a prototype and creating a real application. Uh, what it requires is a lot of human labor to make sure that it's working well, debug it, manage it. So training models largely or originates in the Western world. Um, how, you know, uh, how is AI trustworthy to be used for situations in non-Western settings? This is a really great question. In fact, I've been um, working with some collaborators um, all over um, you know, the low and middle income countries uh, where we've been thinking about how to incorporate languages that are um, not Western, right? How to think about um, properly implementing cultural values all over the world. I, I think that the answer is that it's going, it's expensive to train these models, but there are, um, you know, public institutions, like there's a big collaboration called Bloom, uh, where people are, um, it's a fully open source project. People are encouraged to, from all over the world to participate and help train these, um, these models. Um, okay, so, so all these, all these times it's a computer who's learning as French, for example, Duolingo. Yeah, um, I think that it's important for us to, you know, um, think about where this technology is going to go. And I think that the technology is going to help us learn, right? I think that actually as a learning tool, this technology is amazing. It's eventually it will help teachers uh, to have an assistant that can meet every student where they are, help them with their learning process. You know, I teach an undergraduate class of about 80 students. Um, I don't have enough time that I can dedicate dedicate to every single student in my class, right? AI is able to meet the students to actually help them learn how to debug code, um, 
to be able to answer questions. I think it's got this potential um, that's going to be just fantastic, you know. And what we're going to do is that all these companies and teaching consortiums, they're all going to work together. Uh, and I think we're going to see large blocks of collaborative groups working together to improve um, learning objectives. Okay, so how real or possible is the hypothesis of singularity in AI? Okay, I will try to close with some thoughts of the future and why I don't think that this is a likely scenario. Um, so the singularity is when we have some form of super intelligence um, that will occur. This means that we have programs that are more intelligent uh, than um, human, just all of human society. Uh, the reason why I don't think that this is likely in the soon to be future uh, is because there are some limitations. Uh, one of the limitations is just the amount of uh, parameters that can grow. Uh, there's this exponential process where um, to go from, uh, you know, 100 billion to a trillion uh, takes even more compute and more data to go from a trillion to 10 trillion uh, takes even more. And frankly, we're starting to run out of data. Um, so that's one problem. The other thing that I think we're going to see is basically that this type of generative AI, right, when it comes down to it, it is still has limitations about what it can actually do and create. And those limitations are that it's limited largely by what it can extrapolate from the data that it's been trained on. And this means that actually going beyond the most expert human intelligence is going to be quite difficult, um, so much so that I think it will take an entirely new um, new methods to be able to get there, right? With the current existing methods, I don't think that we have the ability to do that. Um, that is not to say that maybe in some future world that's uh, not possible. Um, but I don't think it's likely. And the final thing that I'll say is that the, the danger, meaning that it will somehow um, end humanity, uh, I think we have much more dangerous problems from humans than we do from AI. It's an unfortunate truth. Um, but I think that humans with issues like nuclear war and climate change, unfortunately, have a much higher way that we can make our own selves extinct than that a computer does. Um, and so I, I foresee that the tool being used in malicious ways that are dangerous is a much more likely outcome of what can happen. And then, um, yes, let me uh, go to the end um, so that I can share the QR code. Thank you, Zhao, for this very, very interesting presentation. I'll share in Suriname, so I'll say how we saw the new and blue match here. Is that to a fair to you? Thank you. Ik yeah. wil je echt hartelijk bedanken voor uh, de tijd die je genomen hebt om uh, het allemaal uit te leggen. En ik wil ook alle uh, bezoekers bedanken uh, voor hun aanwezigheid en voor hun actieve uh, participatie in de chat. Ik vond het heel uh, interessant en ik hoop dat, uh, dat, dat die mening gedeeld wordt. Ja. Ik ga dan afsluiten. Ja, ik zou zeggen, als men vragen heeft, uh, ik ben bereikbaar en uh, always happy to talk. <laughs>
Oké, okay, geweldig. Misschien kan je uh, je bereikbaarheid, een e-mailadres of zo, even in de chat intikken. Ja. Dan, uh, dan kunnen mensen die je nog persoonlijk willen benaderen, dat uh, op die manier doen. Ja. Nou, hartstikke bedankt allemaal. En uh, ik zou zeggen, tot de volgende keer. Bedankt. Thank you.